Good evening. Our city clerk has some announcements to make regarding our Zoom broadcasting. Madam City Clerk. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. The city, um, excuse me, pursuant to section three of executive order N2920 issued by Governor Newsom on March 17th, 2020, the regular meeting of the city council for May 12th, 2020 will be conducted telephonically through Zoom and broadcast live on the city's website. Please be advised that pursuant to the executive order and to ensure the health and safety of the public by limiting human contact that could spread the COVID-19 virus, the council chamber will not be open for the meeting. Some members of council will be participating remotely and will not be physically present in the council chamber. If you would like to speak on an agenda item, you can access the meeting by dialing the phone number listed below, which is star six seven one six six nine nine zero zero nine one two eight and enter meeting ID number eight seven six zero three four two five one three two and password number seven one nine two two eight. The city wants you to know that you can also submit your comments by email to CC public comment at Grand Terrace dash CA dot gov. The city of Grand Terrace thanks you in advance for taking all precautions to prevent spreading the COVID-19 virus. This time we'll call to order the regular city council meeting for the city of Grand Terrace. If you would, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Madam City Clerk, may we have roll call, please. Council Member Allen. I'm, <clears throat> I'm present. Can you hear me? Yes. Council Member Hussey. Present. Present. Council Member Robles. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. I'm here. Mayor McNabo. Present. Madam Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. I'm here. We have no special presentations tonight. Do we have any reordering additions or removal of items from the agenda? Yes, Madam Mayor. We uh, need to, one, two, three. we need to take item number Madam Mayor, um, Item seven is going to be moved to new business uh, right after item number 10. It's under listed in our public hearing and apparently it is not a public hearing. So it's being moved to new business. But after number 10. Correct. Okay. All right. Very good. So next we have our consent calendar items, which are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They are to be acted upon by city council at one time without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or citizen may request removal of an item from the consent calendar for discussion. Are there any requests for items from the consent calendar be, to be removed? Right. Seeing no requests, is there, uh, I'll entertain a motion for the consent calendar. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Right, I have a motion by Council Member Hussey and a second by Council Member Allen. Will, will you call the vote, please? Madam City Clerk. Council Member Allen. It looked like you said yes, but I couldn't hear anything. I said yes. Okay. Council Member Hussey? Yes. yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNamara? Yes. Yes. The motion passes yes. unanimously. Quite an echo. Quite an echo. <laughs> right. 
Next on our agenda is public comment. Do we have any requests to speak at this time? Actually, Madam Mayor, I received one written communication first, and then we do have a caller. Okay. Uh, one written commission uh, was received by Mike Rea, who wanted to remind the council that last year the results of the cannabis workshop ended by the council voting to bring the issue back to the council in June of this year. Therefore, June is right around the corner, so he wanted to give council a friendly reminder to get prepared. All right, very good. Thank you, Mr. Rea. I'm going to admit one caller that we have on the line, and I do believe that is Supervisor Brown. All right. <clears throat> Supervisor Rao, are you on the line? I am. Hello, Supervisor Rao. Can you Rao. hear me? Yes. It, um, thank you for being here tonight. You had an update to give us, and I, we would appreciate hearing that. I did. I just wanted to, to give you a little bit of information about what's going on at the county. Uh, Madam Mayor, I know that you are on a lot of the calls with the chairman and have familiarity with the, some of the things that I'll say, but uh, it is changing hourly, daily. We are as frustrated probably as most of your council and your citizens. And so I wanted to start by giving a CARES Act Funding update, the county has been told we will receive $380 million for COVID-related expenses only. And Councilmember Allen, this speaks to the correspondence that you sent me earlier today, and I kind of wanted to touch on this a little bit. That is very, very specific funding that the county can only use for COVID-related expenses from March 1st forward. We will be audited on everything, and it is explicit that it cannot be used to backfill any revenue loss of any sort. So it is um, a little bit of a challenge for us in how the county moves forward with, this, with the spending of that. And um, we are trying to figure out creative ways to get that to our partners to help. One of those ways was the chairman's idea to have COVID compliant businesses, which kind of speaks to the incentivizing plan that we are working to lay out with the governor, which I'll touch on in a minute. The next round of CARES Act funding is slated to be for cities that have a population of less than 500,000. I've communicated to our federal partners that we would really like that to go directly to the cities for any of the losses that you have incurred. Um, and to have that be a little bit more liberal in its usage than what we are restricted for at the county level. So I'm not sure when that is coming, but that has been told, we've been told that that is in progress. And Madam Mayor, you may have even more of an update than I do on that. But as far as that, that last round, the 380 million that came to the county, it is only for COVID related expenses and we can't use it to help backfill revenue losses either at the county or the city level. One of the things that we do believe that we are able to do with that funding is to provide it to our small businesses. And the chairman has a plan, uh, which he's calling sort of his COVID compliant plan that has yet to be approved fully by the board. We anticipate at least $30 million being approved by the board to have go to our small businesses that remain COVID compliant. And what we mean by that is either to remain closed under the restrictions currently in place by Governor Newsom, or as we begin to open our phases, to implement whatever the restrictions are as those phases begin to open. So whether that's a restriction in capacity, like reduced seating in restaurants, perhaps, uh, plexiglass between our customers and our clerks or anything like that, whatever the compliance measures may be for each sector, that if your business is compliant with that, we want to incentivize it. Right now, our working plan looks like it's going to be businesses that are less than 100 employees, and the amount that they could apply for beginning in July would be $2,500 per business. So it is a unique program that the chairman of the board would like to present to the governor to say, these are the things that we're doing to try to incentivize our are businesses that are struggling to remain compliant and we know that it is becoming harder and harder every day and that it is very, very difficult to ask that of a small business owner that's likely to lose everything that they have worked so hard for. So with that, we have also submitted a letter with all of our mayors, 24 of them, 
requesting permission for our county to implement its own phasing. And tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, the Board of Supervisors will um, have the opportunity to see our specific unique phasing plan that is different than the governor's. We believe that it matches up with the needs of our more rural and remote county better than a one size fits all that's coming out of the state. And our plan is to ask for permission to implement that. We are also hoping to have signers from San Diego County, Riverside, Orange, perhaps even Ventura County jump on with us and ask for that ability to be autonomous and how we choose to phase ourselves to be open. And with the incentivizing that we're doing, with the asking of permission, we are hopeful that the governor will not do what he did to our northern counties, which was to threaten to withhold FEMA funding, which in our county's case could be hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars if we ever had an emergency. And I'm not sure that the Board of Supervisors has the appetite to uh, call the, the governor out on that challenge. So we really find ourselves in a very, very difficult spot. We will be discussing tomorrow enforcement. If businesses choose to open, um, it will be my recommendation that perhaps we kick those enforcement actions to each individual city for you all to choose what you choose to do with the enforcement, whether that's to enforce it all or how you want to handle it. We will have our phasing guidelines in place that you could perhaps give your businesses and say, when the county is given its permission by the governor, this is what it would look like to safely reopen. Um, but that will be up to you to decide. And again, the board will take that action or at least look to take that action tomorrow. And I, I think that we all recognize the significant financial position that we are all in. The county is in as bad a shape as every city here. Um, I am screaming from the dais that this only takes into consideration our physical well-being and that I truly believe personally that uh, we are holistic human beings. We have our spiritual, our mental, our emotional health, as well as our physical health. And right now we seem to have a huge imbalance where Governor Newsom and the state is only taking into consideration our physical health. So very frustrating for me personally, and I would like to see us back in balance. And I know it's affecting us all and, and will for months and years to come. So please know that you have an advocate for a safe reopening um, with me on the board and that we are trying to get to a place where we aren't held hostage by the governor withholding funds from us in the future or potentially even the CARES Act funding that he could withhold. So we find ourselves in a, a very, very challenging spot and we recognize the challenges that you have and are trying to help mitigate those as best we can under the constraints. So happy to answer any questions that you may have and always I'm available to reach after hours or during the business day via cell or email. Thank you very much, Supervisor Rao. Um, as we are in public comment, um, we do have an opportunity for council members to ask a clarifying question if they would like. So are there any questions for clarification of the supervisor at this time? I have one. Okay, council member Allen. <clears throat> Um, hi, Supervisor Rao, and thank you for your uh, update. And my uh, question to you would be, if cities um, are tasked with taking over the responsibility for enforcement, do you think that any of that $380 million, which is only for COVID-19, could be allocated for that COVID-19 enforcement? Thank you. I absolutely. I absolutely think that it is um, an allowable expense that could be passed through to you for COVID enforcement. And that's a great suggestion. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Doug Wilson had a clarifying question as well. Thank you, Supervisor Rao. Uh, a couple of questions in relation to the mes more esoteric losses. For example, you know, of course we had, you know, we don't want to go down the same road. We after the fact with the RDA. Uh, we realize that the accounting will, of course, will be very, very stringent, the partitioning that's required for that. But is there a specific de description? Uh, you know, these code books are usually uh, figured in a definition. And uh, I'm looking for a definition of allowable loss. For example, uh, what about the waste as we started to run up towards this? Nobody realized uh, 
how much waste might be involved for some of the businesses, especially the restaurants. And then, uh, you know, uh, things that are harder to, to uh, put your finger on, for example, market loss and client loss, you know, the long-term uh, social, as you mentioned, uh, implications. And are those under that definition? Revenue loss is explicitly called out that it is not an allowable reimbursement. Um, so that's unfortunate because much like your city, the county also relies on sales tax for that. So we cannot replace those CARES Act funds for revenue loss. In terms of, like as you mentioned, the garbage buildup for certain businesses, those would be not necessarily the loss to the city in terms of revenue, but rather the specific business. And so the CARES Act funding that we would allocate, that $2,500 that I mentioned in the COVID compliant business, the business owner can absolutely take that $2,500 if they apply for it and receive it and use it towards that type of mitigation if they have it. See. Thank you. And what about the long-term social? Has there been any discussion in relation to that? Anything that is touchy-feely, esoteric, that we can't quantify to include my spiritual well-being and yours is just not, we can't, we can't even get the governor to have our, our places of worship and our faith base considered to be um, essential or even considered in phase two. And even when we place the argument on how our churches help us with placement of homeless and helping feed people and everything else, he classifies them in the entertainment sector. So very, very frustrating um, for a lot of us to have that. And so, no, we have not been able to make a connection with either the government or the, with the state or the federal government in some of those softer um, losses that we are all experiencing. I'm glad you used the word soft. Uh, if there was a way to somehow quantify that over a two year period or, or something up in relation to dollars uh, for uh, psychiatric or uh, medical care, would they then uh, start heading towards a, a, a way to a lot of money? I'm not sure of that. I call that the second order of effects, correct? I mean, we have people that are losing their entire lives around them. How can there not be a, a second order of effect from that, from a, a mental, emotional standpoint? And when I talk about us being holistic creatures, we have to, I think, be in balance. And that speaks to that. And that just hasn't had any, it hasn't resonated at all with our governor. And I'm, I'm truly at a loss as to that because it does create, I mean, if we lose our homes, if people are out because they can't afford rent, and, and those protections are currently in place at the moment, but certainly not long-term. And how do we help people get back on their feet for the long haul where they don't lose their businesses, their homes, their marriages, and things like that. And those effects will be long lasting. And I'm not sure that the government will have the appetite to quantify that as COVID related. Certainly if they did, they would be doing it now and saying that, that maybe our shelter in place has ramifications just greater than our physical health. And we're not seeing that out of Governor Newsom's office yet. Understood. Thank you very much. Mr. Duffy, you had a clarifying question. Yes. Uh, good, good evening, Supervisor Rao. One of the questions that I had is that the, the CARES Act establishes funding for the county in two ways. One is through the CBDG CV funding for like, community development block grants. And the other is, is for populations over 500,000. And so it's my understanding that HUD sent out specific uh, guidelines that said monies to cities that were, that were earmarked for for those cities with over 500,000 uh, population, that they could, there were no restrictions on that money. Is that the $380 million that you, that you were referencing earlier today? No, so HUD's money and its allocation is separate from that and Grant Harris's allocation. And as a matter of fact, we have four cities within the county of San Bernardino that participate in the community Be development block grant that is coming out of our housing and urban development. And the disbursement from the county to those cities had to be a minimum of $100,000 to each municipality that participates. And we had four that based on the criteria, and this was very interesting to me as a new supervisor, 
um, we had a, a disproportionate amount, I felt, in my opinion, that was going to one city over the rest of the cities. And so I dug in deeper to find out. And there are certain things that they determine. So it's your population, it's your level of poverty, it's your density um, of housing related to the unhoused and how they go in and uh, arrive at a score. And so some cities receive a higher allocation of the CDBG funding. And we did have four cities, and I believe Grand Terrace was one of them, that were under the $100,000 threshold for that disbursement of the federal funding to come for, for COVID. And the county backfilled and made up the difference in that so that each city would have at least a minimum of $100,000 that would come to them through that um, CDBG funding. So, but that is different than the $380 million that I referenced. Thank you. Mayor, I have another question. Okay, Mayor. Count, Count, Councilmember Allen, uh, clarifying question. Remember, we're still in public comment. And you're muted now. Hmm. Okay, start over, please. Nope. Uh, never mind. Are you sure? Well, I wanted to ask a, a mention of, uh, you can stop me if, I, if I'm not supposed, it's about this though. Um, I would just like to mention to the supervisor just okay. quickly. Well, it, it, this, this would be a clarifying question time because yeah, we are in public yeah, comment. That's why I said disregard. Okay. It's not really so you'll follow up with the supervisor after as she has, as she has invited us to, correct? Right. Okay. That's correct. Thank you very much. Supervisor Rao, I appreciate you calling in and being with us here tonight and sharing some of the information that you have. And I know that the Board of Supervisors has some work ahead of them for tomorrow. Best wishes to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. I appreciate the time this evening. Have a great night. Thank you, you too. All right, do we have any other requests to speak during this time? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, so we'll close public comment and bring it back to the Council for their communications. And we will begin with Jeff Allen. Um, I have nothing to report, Mayor. I did go to the uh, city testing that they had at the Azure Hills Church for the coronavirus, so I participated in that. I'd like to thank the county for doing that for us and for the city manager and staff for helping work that out. Um, that was a, a great thing, well run, and thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Council Member Bill Hussey. Uh, nothing at this time, Mayor. All right, thank you. Council Member Sylvia Robles. Hi, uh, yes. Um would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the passing of uh, former County Supervisor Dennis Hansberger. Uh, he served um, as a County Supervisor for um, Grand Terrace both times that he served. And sitting here, I realized that we are a city because he um, um, shepherded that process and advocated for, for Grand Terrace. And I knew him because I worked for the Board of Supervisors um, during his um, second term and um, I felt, you know, personal loss. I, I really looked up to him. Um, many of the uh, obituaries that mention um, his strong um, moral uh, compass and his diligence um, to make sure there was a right outcome and policy is really appreciated and I just wanted to make sure um, I, I mentioned that. Thank, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, Doug Wilson. I have nothing at this time. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. All right. During our environmental times here, we still continue on with our transportation. Omnitrans Board of Directors, they uh, met on May 6th, and they were looking at, um, if you can believe this, through the end of February of this year, Omnitrans system-wide ridership was up 1.8%, but it was still up compared to last year at this time. So it was on pace to be the first positive ridership year since 2012. And so following the stay-at-home order, Omnitrans ridership fell 65% compared to prior year and remained at that level from mid-March through mid-April. And so at the, at the last board meeting, Omnitrans um, gave a presentation to the board on its emergency service deployment plan, which the board accepted. And so the routes that they operate every 10, 15, or 20 minutes were reduced to 30 minutes. Routes that operated every 30 minutes were reduced to hourly. 
This kept every Omnitrans route in service in order to provide lifeline coverage service through Omnitrans service area. One of the things that they did put in place is they began to have uh, entry through the back of their buses so that their drivers were kept at a distance from the riders. And because of that, riders were not able to um, put money in the fare box. So the rides are essentially free at this time. So not only has ridership fell, but, but they're not charging for ridership. So additionally, like I said, with the decline in ridership, the resulting fair revenue and the state of the economy resulting in financial uncertainty, they have looked at um, certain flexible plans that they're going to put in place with respect to layoffs if, um, if things don't open up and ridership doesn't increase. They are looking at a, um, the reduced service through the summer and they figure that the ridership will not rebound quickly. Summer ridership is typically 10 to 15% below other months and with schools, colleges, and universities reopening for normal activities, um, there might be a trigger for beginning to restore service. On May 6, the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority Board met and it was um, really timely. We were able to have a firsthand report on economic conditions by Christopher Thornburg from UC Riverside Center for Economic Forecasting and Development in our special meeting packet. Um, the Beacon Economics Report was something that has come through uh, Christopher Thornburg's business, so it was nice to be able to hear him give a first-hand account on his take on what he believes could be a very quick recovery once we do eventually start to open. So we approved, we also approved a revised local transportation fund estimate apportionment based on reduced fiscal year revenue estimates from the previous estimate due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We authorized the release of a local transportation fund reserves to transit operators immediately as needed. That would include Omnitrans and other local bus operators. And we also allocated CARES Act funding to these transit operators. We approved the advance of up to five years of the City of San Bernardino's estimated equitable share of Measure I major street project arterial sub program funds for various arterial widening projects. A big part of that is going to be them being able to pay for their share of the Mount Vernon Viaduct project that is set to start sometime in the near future. And we also adopted a final environmental impact report for the West Valley Connector project and related environmental impact report. And uh, we received a little bit of good news from the Southern California Area Association of Governments. Um, SBCTA was awarded the 2020 SCAG Sustainability Award for the Clean Cities Alternative Fuels and Infrastructure. And this was for the Redlands Passenger Rail um, Zero Emission multiple unit buses that we will have come online in a few years. And so then on May 12, or uh, today, there was a conference call with the Board of Supervisor Chair Kurt Hagman, but Supervisor Rao went over um, many of the, the elements to that. One of the things that was mentioned, though, is that the federal legislature is set to vote on Friday on what they're calling the HERO Act. And this is going to look like 12, or $3 trillion of that 250 billion specifically to cities and they're expecting that those funds will have a recovery of lost expenses component to it. And so that was one of the things that we were not getting from the, the CARES Act funding that we currently have or the FEMA. And so I do have a, um, a copy of what the HEROES Act goes over. I'm not gonna, not gonna talk about it in depth, but if any of my colleagues are interested in a copy of this, I will forward what was sent to me from the Board of Supervisors as I said, they're set to vote on it Friday, so we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. And so with the passing of former Supervisor Dennis Hansberger, I would like to close in his memory today. And that will be the end of my report. So we will move back to our agenda. We do not have public hearings because we moved that to new business. So we will go on to unfinished business which is the um, item number eight on our agenda, second reading and adoption of an ordinance to adopt by reference the 2019 California Fire Code with local amendments. And so since this is a second reading, 
We do not have a staff report, is that correct? That, that, okay. no, no, no report, correct? There's just an introduction, there's no, there's no report. Okay. Mr. Weiss, can you please no. unmute? Mr. Weiss, do you have an introduction for this item? Um, yes, actually, uh, I did have a brief report, but it's it's really not necessary. Uh, it's uh, it's second reading uh, of, of the ordinance. Uh, no changes have occurred since the April 28th meeting, and it would be an ordinance of the council, the city of Grand Terrace, adopting by reference the 2019 fire code as amended by the San Bernardino Fire Protection District number 2001 and repealing and replacing Grand Terrace Municipal Code Chapter 151.18 in its entirety to incorporate the new code as amended. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Do you have any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. Any final last burning questions at this point? No, okay. I'll entertain a motion to uh, um, on this item. Is there a motion on this item? So moved. Make a motion. Okay, so I have a motion by Council Member Robles and a second by Council Member Allen. Mr. City Attorney, will you read by title, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The title of the ordinance is as follows. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California, adopting by reference the 2019 California Fire Code, as amended by San Bernardino County Fire Protection District Ordinance Number 20-01, and repealing and replacing Grand Terrace Municipal Code Chapter 15.18 in its entirety to incorporate the new code as amended. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, and thank you, Director Weiss. Madam City Clerk, will you call the vote, please? Councilmember Allen. Yes. Councilmember Hussey. Yes. Councilmember Robles. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Aye. Mayor McNamara. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Item number nine is the second reading and adoption of an ordinance to oh, amending titles four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve, and thirteen of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code to authorize the adoption of certain fees and deposits by resolution. Is that uh, Assistant City Manager Fortune? Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, um, City Council. As uh, the Mayor had mentioned, it is a, a second reading uh, to amend um, titles 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 13 of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code to authorize the City Council to adopt certain fees and deposits by resolution. Um, no changes have been made to the proposed ordinance since its introduction and it is now ready for uh, the second reading and the adoption. So we can go to the last slide and I'll be happy to answer any questions um, right. City Council may have. Okay. Any last minute questions from the Council? Are there any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. I'll bring it back to Council. For consideration of a motion. I'll make the motion to move the recommendation. Of course you will. Second. All right. Motion by Councilmember Allen, second by Councilmember Hussey. Madam or uh, Mr. City Attorney, will you read the ordinance by title, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The title of the ordinance is as follows: An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California, amending sections in titles four, five, six. 8, 10, 12, and 13 of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code to authorize the City Council to adopt certain fees and deposits by resolution. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Madam City Clerk, will you call the vote, please? Councilmember Allen? Yes. Councilmember Hussey? Yes. Councilmember Robles? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNamara? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. 
We will move to item 10 under new business. This is a resolution reaffirming and reorganizing certain fees and deposits originally in the Grand Terrace Municipal Code. Titles 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 13. Madam Assistant City Manager Fortune. Yes, good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor Botam, City Council. Um, I, I do not know if the PowerPoint is up. It is now. Okay. Um, so as you had mentioned, um, this is the resolution to reaffirm uh, the second reading of the ordinance that you just adopted. Next slide, please. So the staff report uh, supports goal number one, ensuring our fiscal viability by ensuring appropriate cost recovery for services provided. Next slide, please. Um, California state law establishes that city council may institute reasonable fees for the processing of permits and regulatory activities. As long as the fees do not exceed the amount reasonably required to administer the processing of the permits and regulatory activities. Next slide, please. So on April 14, 2020, a first reading was held to amend the Grand Terrace Municipal Code, amending titles 4, 5, 8, 10, 12, and 13 to authorize the City Council to adopt certain fees and deposits by resolution. No changes have been made to the proposed ordinance since its introduction and the second reading had just been approved. Next slide, please. So the fee set by resolution, the establishment of fees are administrative in nature and more often subject to change in order to effectively allow the city to recover its costs for services provided. And staff will make recommendations for city council approval based on actual costs incurred. Um, next slide, please. Um, as attached, fees will be submitted to City Council annually for their review and approval, and a comprehensive fee schedule, uh, similar to the one that's attached to the staff report, will be submitted for Council's review during the annual budget process. Now, any changes to the fees will have a justification, the reason for it, and those will always be presented to City Council. Um, next slide, please. We also wanted to add that fees may also be submitted to City Council for their review and approval during the course of the fiscal year if staff believes that said fees warrant a separate review instead of waiting for the annual budget approval process. Next slide, please. And as mentioned, this is part of the City Council's top priority projects list. No fees are proposed to be revised or adjusted at this time. So this is the resolution now authorizing that the fees are now in place by resolution since we now have just taken them out of the uh, municipal code. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the adoption of the resolution reaffirming and reorganizing certain fees and deposits previously established in the Grand Terrace Municipal Code. That ends my report. I will be happy to answer any questions City Council may have. Thank you, Assistant City Manager Fortune. Are there any quest uh, questions of staff at this time? All right, see no one asking for questions. Are there any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, we'll come back to council for consideration of a motion. I move adoption of the resolution. I'll second. So I have a motion by Council Member Robles, a second by Council Member Allen. Madam City Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Council Member Allen? Yes. Council Member Hussey? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Potom Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNabo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you. So we will head back to item number seven, which is consideration of recommendations for community development block grant, COVID-19 virus, community development block grant dash CV funds. Is this director Steve Weiss? Yes. 
Madam Mayor, I believe that. Hi, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is uh, Todd Nakasaki, a uh, management analyst. Um, uh, I'll be presenting uh, the CDBG uh, coronavirus uh, funding recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Nakasaki. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, I'm here to talk about the community development block grant coronavirus funding. And uh, next slide, please. And in this presentation, I will give you a brief background of the corona, uh, CDBG coronavirus program, talk about the program requirements, discuss eligible activities for funding, and finally give staff recommendations. Next slide. The staff report uh, <clears throat> before you promotes our 2030 vision statement, a place where residents can enjoy quality of life that fosters pride and an engaged community in that the TDBG program funds community programs that benefit Grand Terrace residents and supports goal number four, develop and implement successful partnerships. Next slide. On March 27th, 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security CARES Act was signed into law to respond to the growing effects of this historic public health pandemic. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, released a special allocation of community development block grant, CDBG funds, to San Bernardino County as a preemptive means through prevention, preparation, and response to coronavirus. Next slide. The CDBG coronavirus program supports activities that prevent and or respond to the spread of the coronavirus or other infectious diseases and requires that activities funded will benefit low and moderate income residents. The C's expected allocation from the county for CDBG coronavirus funds is $100,000. Next slide. As part of the activity application process, uh, city staff met with the San Bernardino County Community Development and Housing Department to discuss CDBG coronavirus program eligible activities. Uh, based on those discussions with the county, two of the three proposed activities considered by city staff were deemed eligible by the county. The first eligible activity um, you'll see on the slide is the food bank partnership program uh, with our local organizations. The recommended funding is $16,000. The second eligible activity is the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department HOPE program. The recommended funding for that is $84,000 for the total requested amount of $100,000. Uh, next slide, please. So staff's recommendation is to uh, prior prioritize funding allocations and authorize staff to submit the city's CDBG coronavirus funding recommendations to the San Bernardino County Economic Development Agency. And next slide. And that concludes my presentation and I can respond to any questions um, and Lieutenant Lane can assist with any questions regarding the HOPE program. Thank you, Mr. Nakasaki. Are there questions of staff at this time? Council Member Robles. What is our homeless population? Based on the last count that we had from um, the point in time count, we had, a, I think it was, a, was at two. But we are seeing, I can say we are seeing significant increase in terms of a homeless population since the, since, uh, the COVID-19 activity. Uh, I don't have the actual count, but I, certainly based upon the calls and the information that we receive from the Sheriff's Department, I, I can provide you with updated information. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Mr. Nagasaki, I, I do have a question about the, uh, the distribution through the HOPE uh, program. How, how are these uh, commodities, if I'm, if I'm assuming correctly, uh, then distributed to what sector of the uh, population? I couldn't speak to the sector of the population. Um, I, I think the numbers were run based on that first uh, pilot program that we had done. 
Um, and uh, I had uh, met with Director Weiss uh, to, um, to make that uh, recommendation. So in the, Mr. Duffy? Sure, I, and so just a point of clarity, I, I think I didn't quite understand uh, Mayor Pro Tem's question regarding the distribution. Was he referencing the, for the whole program or was it for the, uh, the food bank program also? I believe it was for the HOPE team, or were you asking for the, the direct allocation between the two projects, Mayor Pro Tem? The, the mayor is correct. It was the HOPE program. I just wanted to find out how the coordination, the, the let's say, uh, boots on the ground coordination actually takes place. And that might be something for Lieutenant. To, to Lane. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Uh, the HOPE team, as you know, is a component of the Sheriff's Department that um, in, engages in contacting and providing outreach services for uh, members of the community who uh, are determined to be homeless. Um, to respond to, I think, a population count, uh, some information that I've received uh, from the HOPE team recently with regards to numbers in this city. Um, are still relatively low, even though it appears that uh, certain increases may be seen throughout the community. But, but they've assured me that um, they, they deal regularly and, and have statistical data on four individuals within the city that they uh, have provided services to. So uh, with that said, there's uh, certain um, services and, and outreach opportunities that that HOPE team can provide to those folks. Um, and, and I don't have all of the particular information as to how they go about doing that or what those services are. Uh, but they do uh, uh, provide uh, joint support through other organizations in the county. I'm not sure if that adequately answers your question, however. Mayor Pro Tem, does it well, answer your question? I'm sorry, the only, the only other meat I'd like to know about it is, okay, so what does it, what's the impact on the need? How do I, I, uh, somebody handing canned food to somebody or, or are they paying their rent? Uh, I know the county has a lot of programs in relation to that, uh, welfare to work and, and transitional programs. And I, I really trust the sheriff's office in the way they administrate things. They know their people. They know who's out there. The, they've got boots on the ground all the time. Uh, I'd just like to know how, you know, how the program works. So, so, Mr. Duffy? Yes, yeah, so, Mayor Pertin, if I can join in. So, if you recall, the whole program required us to have some officers, uh, although the whole program does have a team of, I think, four people who are trained on, and their overall aspect is for community outreach. So, they're, they're trained on all of the county social programs. So when they engage the homeless population, they also provide them with information. They provide them with information on uh, where to go, what to do. Let me just give you very quickly uh, a, a successful story that happened recently. So um, most recently, a gentleman who used to be uh, live in the, in the motor home park in Grand Terrace, um, he was... Um, uh, removed from the motorhome park and parked the, the trailer on the outside next to Fitness Park. Uh, that gentleman was, I think, an 80-year-old person. The motorhome didn't work anymore. He was actually um, aligned with someone who was taking advantage of him. The neighbors in the area were very concerned, first, about the motorhome being there and leaking sewage and so on and so on. The second thing was the gentleman was an elderly gentleman who they said was dehydrated and had some concerns. So once that information came out, the HOPE team was activated. The HOPE team uh, found uh, his son. They actually engaged the son to come out. They engaged um, a location where the, the vehicle could be towed and, and transported, and they also found housing along with the county housing program. So that's a successful story where the, the HOPE officers or the sheriff's department, their number one goal is to engage the homeless population. But they engage and they also have a list of resources that they can, they can connect those county resources with that person to get them the help that, 
that they need. And that would be the case in terms of, of our current HOPE program. Uh, currently, we had about uh, $26,000 in our housing program that we allocated to um, the HOPE program. Uh, the officer who comes out, I think, 10 hours a month, comes out and what he does is he was trained on making the connection with all the social services that are there. Some of our past successes have been the HOPE officers have identified homeless camps that are surrounding the Grand Terrace area. They've worked with us to clear those camps and also provide resources. There, are, there have been cases where the, the HOPE officer has made contact with an individual seven to eight times before the individual actually uh, receive the, the, the help that the officer, officer wanted. So that's one way in which the program uh, works, sir. Thank you. I, you certainly answered my question, and I applaud uh, the sheriff's program. I think, it's, I think it's great, and it takes a lot of guts to do those uh, kinds of services. And, and so, Mayor, May, may I also add something to the, to the conversation in, in terms of the background associated with this uh, CBDG CV grant? So when we, re we received this notice, we were given categories, very restrictive categories in terms of what you can apply for. Uh, there was um, small business loans. There was um, uh, food bank help um, or... Uh, testing facilities or um, modification of your existing facility, improvements to your existing facilities for COVID-related activities. And so we submitted three applications. Uh, and primarily because, for example, we thought about doing the uh, small business loan program, but then you'd have to develop the infrastructure in order to, in order to do that. And so by the time we felt that we'd be able to pull this together and be able to get the, apply for the grants, we would miss out on, on helping those, those uh, small businesses. So one of the applications that wasn't approved was we, we called for a, um, uh, a remodel of our HVAC system in our community room in case we needed to have more, more blood drive testing. things. Like that. So we, would, we wouldn't have the recirculation of the, of the air process going. They said that that was not uh, uh, acceptable. So they said, these are the programs that you can work on. So then we ended up having three programs that was uh, um, almost equally funded, moving them to only those primary, those two, those two programs. And so that left us, and we also, I talked with the county, um, I was on a phone call with probably five county individuals saying to them, why can't you approve a menu of programs and then allow us to bring those programs to the, to the city council and then we can look at what's working and then we can say, let's choose one of these programs. But they indicated that um, the way the process it has to work is it has to be project specific for your community. And so, when the council approves these programs, then those programs will go to the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supervisors will have a larger meeting for the approval of all of the programs that they have in place. All right. Council Member Robles. Um, I remember the HOPE program. I remember how, how it was funded and all that. It just struck me odd that eight hours per week on homeless would come up to 84,000 in a, in a year. No, the existing program was $26,000. No, I know, that's yeah. not my question. My question is how does 84,000, how do you get eight hours per week equaling 84,000 for, for a year? It says the cover deputy was will assign an additional eight hours per week. I guess I don't understand, we're paying for the 40 hour deputy or an eight hour deputy? Okay, um, Mr. Weiss, you or Todd wanna to answer that question why I just kind of, I'm trying to look at the information that, that she's referencing. Mr. Nakasaki. Can you address that question? Um, I don't have the hour, the 
I would say the breakdown for the hours. Um, I, I did base that off of the 26,000 uh, and extrapolated that for extended period of, um, I think, a, a number of four months or so. All right, so the last allocation we had covered how much time? Yeah, so, so this, this paragraph that we're referencing, it, it, it relates to the September 11, 2018 housing program, which, was, which was, was based on eight hours. We're not saying that eight hours is going to equal 84. We're going to be getting additional hours with, with the whole program with $84,000. And so um, my... It's so my quick calculation. Uh, we pay about $79 to $80 per hour for, for a share of. Okay. And so you would look at this number and you d divide that by that. Uh, Council Member Robles, if, uh, have you looked at packet page 100? I can't get to packet page Okay. <laughs> then I'm going to ask this question <laughs> in anticipation of you looking at that. Okay. It says 49000 for personnel and 35000 for equipment, rental, lease, or purchase. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. So there's a 49000 in personnel. Now there's this equipment charge of 35000 What equipment would we be purchasing for this program? Mr. Nakasaki? Um, oh, go, go ahead, Steve. Did you have? Mayor um, and, and Council, um, I, in anticipation of, of the COVID, um, I, I think part of it was to deal with any type of crisis that could occur. We were, we were, we were looking at this uh, pandemic um, from a worst case scenario, that there could be other equipment, that there could be other support from um, the sheriff. Maybe there could be other uh, people that, that might need to support it, similar to what... Um, City Manager uh, Duff, um, City Manager Duffy stated um, there could be other uh, indigent type, types of people in the community that could need these types of services. Mayor, I also think that part of the thing is too is that that uh, with the COVID nineteen, I think that the first responders are having additional equipment that they're, that they're, as they're responding to personal protective equipment. Yes. Uh, and that might be a portion, a portion of some of, some of the costs associated with this. And so it looks like that based on the personnel costs, we're looking at about 612 hours of, 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 of additional labor from the Sheriff's Department to, to, to be able to respond to um, uh, hope-related homeless activities. The, we can come, certainly come back with a list of details based upon what this $35,000 uh, would, would be. Okay. Further questions? Uh Council Member Robles. Okay. Council Member Hesse. It's for Mr. Duffy. So, what, how many hours do we have prior in the HOPE program before? I believe the staff report indicates that it's about uh, eight hours per week focusing on assisting homeless. Okay. <clears throat> this question, when, because uh, we personally had a run in with a homeless person and uh, you were trying to get a hold of the HOPE officer, and I guess they weren't available at the time. And then, unfortunately, an incident occurred with your vehicle, personal incident, and, uh, and the sheriffs had to be called. I mean, if we had this more hours on here, would that incident would have been avoided? Probably if the HOPE officer was there. Well, you know, one of the things that happens is that because we have the HOPE officer for eight hours, it, that means it, it, he could have a certain routine or a day. And so um, when we call now, we call the sheriff, and the sheriff comes out. And the sheriff comes out, and it's not, a high, it's not the high-priority call because it's just, the checking, it's just the checking on the situation. So if you have a HOPE officer in town more hours per day, it becomes their priority call. And so it's sort of like, uh, you know, when you have priority emergency one, two, and three, this is probably a three or four in terms of activity. So having a HOPE officer in town would make, more often, would make a, a homeless-related issue a higher, a higher priority, absolutely. All right, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Um, Council Member Allen. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, 
<clears throat> I, some of the, my question, I was going to use uh, the reference on page uh, 100, but the mayor already went there with that. I was going to suggest with the equipment, you could look at our CERT program, but my um, other question is, were there any other programs other that did, were unrelated to that? And uh, the, for example, for seniors, for our senior center, or for seniors in general? Mr. Deff. Um, we or do they qualify? They don't. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, count, uh, Council Member Al, um, actually, that we did look into these these areas, but uh, one one challenging area is that Grand Terrace Terrace's demographics really do not fit in with what's called the low moderate category. So, similar to what Mr. Duffy uh, cited regarding the um, the air exchange system at the community room, are they? These are the types of programs that, unfortunately, Grand Terrace cannot qualify. Okay, thanks. Thank you. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Allen. So, Mr. Duffy, you mentioned that one of the categories was testing. Was that paying to have testing sites come here? Well, it would be it would be doing your your testing sites. It would be doing out, outfitting uh, your city hall or a location for for a testing center. Yes. Is it too late to add that in as, as a, another option to have more, another testing day here? Well, here's the thing. The, the, the county public health will, will work with you on, on establishing that. For example, okay. one of the things the county public health says that, that they will, they have a, a set day. They will establish a day at our, at our senior center for testing just for that, the elderly population. So we're working with them on that. All right, so we don't share in the cost of those testing days. We, we, do, we do not, absolutely. Okay. And it's just like, for example, the food program, the, the, the Great Plates program that the county's putting on that allows seniors to get three meals per day. Um, that is a, a free service but the state's put on that the that the county each county is operating. We don't have to pay for that. Our goal is to, is to promote that to promote that program. The one area that we could connect with was with our local nonprofits for the for the food banks, and so we were able to to, to move that forward. Okay, and I I have seen a a number of um, individuals that I believe are homeless that are new to this community within the last month or two. And so even though our point in time count was very low, I think we do have a number of yeah. additional individuals that have come to our city, probably because it's a safe place to be, I would guess. So. All right, um, any further questions of staff at this time? All right, any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, we'll bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Councilmember Hesse. I'd like to make a motion to apply to authorize the staff to apply for the CDBG coronavirus program funding for both the Food Bank Partnership Program and for the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Hope Program. I'll second it. All right. I have a motion by Council Member Hussey and a second by Council Member Robles. Madam City Clerk, will you call the vote, please? Council Member Allen? Yes. Council Member Hussey? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNabo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Our next item of business is item number 11 on the agenda, City of Colton environmental, environmental document for public review pertaining to development of 79 single-family residential homes to be located along Lytton Avenue, Bostock, and Palm Avenue in the La Loma Hills north of La Cadena Drive. Mr. Steve Weiss. Thank you, Mayor McNabeau and council members. Uh, the item before you is, as you mentioned, a notice of intent to release an environmental document. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as a background, Planning and Development Services, we did receive a notice of public comment um, from the city of Colton, serving, who serves as the lead agency. Um, so the, the notice basically talks about a mitigated negative declaration uh, for single, 79 single family detached cluster style homes on 49 acres. And it's located along Lytton Avenue, Bostock and Palm Avenue 
in the La Loma Hills north of South La Cadena Drive. Next slide, please. This is, I don't expect you to read this whole thing, but it's an example of, uh, of what um, you would receive in the mail if you lived within a certain distance of the project. It basically talks about the notice, the location, and also the availability of the um, environmental document that's hyperlinked on this, and I'll show that later, and it talks about the amount of time you, you can comment on this. Next slide, please. Uh, this notice was also sent to all bordering Grand Terrace residences along the eastern boundary of the project, and staff is currently reviewing the draft environmental document for public comment. Next slide, please. So here's a little map that shows the project area. The project site is in, in black, and uh, Grand Terrace is just right there, which I colored in to show you that it it's shares the border. Um, it, it's pretty much along Bostock Avenue, and this area is a semi-private road in this area. There's, um, it's very hilly up there, um, and uh, basically this, this is the area, um, and they're, gonna, they're basically going to cut into the hills and flatten the homes, uh, flat, flatten the pads and put up uh, homes between five and 12,000, uh, lots five and 12,000 square feet. Next slide, please. This is an example of the development plan for the homes, the 79 homes. It's, um, you, would ent you would enter from Lytton Avenue and uh, then you would, um, and then you would go right on Bostock, but um, it's, they own a considerable amount of more property there. Next slide, please. So here's an example of the elevations. This came out of the environmental document. They've applied for um, a full development package um, to tentative track map, um, a development plan, um, and but those those are not going to hearing um, in the near future. They have not been scheduled, but the uh, the environmental document is is what public agencies and residents are reviewing. Next slide, please. Uh, so the recommendation um, at this time this is this is more of a receive and file for you, but just so you're aware, if your constituents ask you about the project and that we are. On top of it, we're working on it. Um, it's available for public review, 30 days. Um, if you um, if you hyperlink this, go to the Col uh, the Colton website. It will provide all the technical studies and all that. Um, so again, we're providing this for information only, and therefore requesting City Council receive and file this report. Next slide, please. Thank you, Director. And that my remarks, and um, if you should have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Director Weiss. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson, you have questions? I'd just like to mention uh, to Director Weiss uh, that we recently agreed to maintain a traffic light along uh, La Cadena, and it appears as if this uh, project might contribute to some traffic uh, load along that area. Um, how were they, I know that you're in the process of reviewing their envi environmental impact report. Uh, is there any mention of uh, circulation uh, impact? Um, that's a very good question, council member. And probably I know a little bit too much about this project because I was, I was there before. So <laughs> um, there actually, there is a fair share component tied to that signal. And that's not just there, but it actually extends um, the, the applicant is required to pay a fair share um, on a number of intersections, um, not just in Colton, but also in Grand Terrace and uh, along the Caltrans, along the Caltrans area too. So it's identified in there. We're reviewing it for, um, you know, for, for adequacy. So it's something we can count on that the money will filter down to the city of Grand Terrace then? Yeah, it's probably not a lot of money, but it, it's a fraction and it will, every little bit will help. Thank you. Mayor. Council Member Allen. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I wanted to ask Mr. Wise. Uh, I just wanna make sure I understand. It's sort of like what uh, Mayor Pro Tim Wilson was talking, asking about. Um, will, there, will there be developer impact fees that'll cover the added load, not just to that light, but to that that section of Lockening and the roads that we own. And that's so an, I think another excellent, another excellent question. Um, it better. Um, that's why we're reviewing it. Uh, we'll, we'll compare it against our roadway programs and everything else too, as far as all forms of services 
um, and we will develop a letter and, and we will, you know, we'll look at the environmental document and comment on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions? Okay. Anybody requesting to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right. Thank you. So we'll bring it back and I'll make a motion to receive and file. I'll second. second. Okay. Please call the vote. Councilmember Allen? Yes. Councilmember Hussey? Yes. Councilmember Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNamo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Item number 12 is the adoption of capital improvement project for fiscal years 2021 through 24-25. Mr. Alan French, Public Works Director. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. Alan French, Public Works Director, uh, here to present this item, which is the annual update for our capital improvement program for the Measure I pass through money. This item supports goal 2030, number two maintaining public safety and investing in critical improvements. Slide, please. In November of 2016, the city adopted a five-year CIP to address road maintenance for the local roads in the city. The pavement management program was used to assign ratings and uh, based on the street condition, then ranked the streets and developed a five-year implementation program. Next slide, please. Uh, this year is the third project, which will include grinding and overlaying of up to 11 streets. The segments um, in this uh, segment, in this portion, are estimated to cost uh, 903000 In addition to that, we are combining the following year streets, which are about eight of them, and to grind and overlay those for the fourth list. And that estimate is about 1.6 million for those slides. For those slides. Next uh, slide, please. This is the fourth year uh, streets that are involved. Next slide, please. We are participating in the total road improvement program to help fund the project. Uh, this, uh, this program borrows money for future allotments to come up with a a, um, a pool of money to do a project uh, all at one time so we can uh, take advantage of the economies of scale. The funds should be available in July this year and we plan to bid the project shortly after. Uh, staff is recommending that council adopt the resolution approving the uh, five-year program at this time. And I, I am happy to answer any questions that council should have. Thank you, Director French. Questions for staff? All right, see no questions. Any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to council to consider a motion. Motion for approval, Mayor. Second. All right, I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson and a second by Council Member Allen. Please call the vote. Council Member Allen. Yes. Council Member Hussey? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Aye. Mayor McNamo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll go to item 13, which is COVID 19 update and strategy to reopen city facilities and request from graduating class of 2020. Mr. Duffy, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the council is aware, on March 24th, 2020, the city uh, council approved a proclamation, emergency proclamation regarding COVID-19. And so now we find ourselves in a little different situation where we're actually coming out of this, we believe we're coming out of the process of going back to n normal. And so one of the things that we are going to be doing is reopening some of our city facilities. As the council is aware, we currently opened uh, Richard Rollins Park, and we also open the fitness park. Each park is outfitted with a hand washing station and a, a big notice that indicates for the residents, to, you know, to be aware that they're in this in this area and that to to, to practice social distancing. 
So our next park is the Veterans Freedom Park. It's opening on May 14th. That's this Thursday. We also were asking residents that should practice social distancing and wear a mask while in the park. Hand washing stations will, will be on site. The restrooms, the play and exercise equipment, gazebos and parking lots will remain closed until further notice. Fields are closed to organize sports. And so this posting is going to go out uh, uh, tonight or tomorrow uh, for the residents in the, in, in the area. Uh, the next park is the dog park. Our scheduled reopening for this is a Thursday, May 21st, 2020. Residents should also once again practice social distancing and wear masks while at the park. Hand washing stations will be on site. Now the following is a recommendation. And so what's happening in, in most of the retail centers we have uh, throughout, the, throughout the country is they're recommending that you, to you really only put about 20% of the, of the use of the space uh, in, uh, allowable to customers. So based on our, our parks, we have in, in the dog park, we have a small park and a large dog park. So we're recommending that no more than eight people are in the small dog park at one time. And we ask people to please limit their time to no more than 30 minutes. Uh, that is just a recommendation to be a good neighbor, to, to, to allow uh, to be able to go in and be able to not have any sort of a social conflict. Uh, on the other side, we have on the large dog park, we're recommending no more than 15 people in the large dog park at one time. And we ask them to please limit the, your time to, to, to 30 minutes. Now, obviously, if you're the only person that's there, you can stay as long as you want. But when there's a big crowd, we, we recommend that you uh, be a good neighbor and allow your neighbors to use the park after you're done. And so we ask people also to please do not use the benches or the picnic tables um, because while we will go through and clean those areas, uh, we, we're not going to be there to clean use one after, one after the other. And so those, those two locations will be opening, as I said, one this Thursday and the, and the dog park will be the following Thursday. Mr. Duffy? Yes. Before you go into this, is there a reason why you're waiting until the 21st for the dog park? Yes, we we had some uh, some issues that recently reoccurred with our, uh, our sprinkler system. The, the the dock park is all solar, so there's no electricity on site, and so we had an issue with the solar panel. The solar panel uh, was uh, was not functioning, so therefore the watering system wasn't in, in, in place. So we'll have the park, we believe, in tip top shape by the by the 21st of of, uh, of May. Right. Councilmember Hussey. So you're saying our grass has died on the dark park? Yes, and there's a, we, we're beginning to have some concern about the grass continues to die in one section of the dog park. Whenever there's an issue, it's just one section. So we've got to pay close attention to that. Either, the, either there's a, um, a fungus or contamination in that, in that particular area, or our sprinkler system isn't properly aligned. We didn't have a staff look at that. I mean, they're not looking at the dog park every day just to check on it prior to opening or see, make sure the sprinklers are working. I mean, if they see the grass is dying, being proactive on this. Well, my goal, my thought process is that, yes, they would have, they would have been proactive. Now, what's happening is this is happening on the very end of the park, and I think the system went, went uh, awry maybe last Thursday or, or, or Friday. And over the weekend, we had, a, we had warm weather, and I think that might, might have been contributed to the factor. But we will certainly make sure that we establish some protocols to ensure that we don't have this problem again. Is there any way you can just cordon off that area of the dog park and open it sooner? Um, we could, we could, we could examine that. Um, let me let me work with the maintenance staff to see wh what um, what what that area looks like. I'm just thinking yeah. of all the parks that we have. That one's probably the easiest one to yeah. to, to social distance and 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 I did walk by the dog park yesterday and it looked pretty nice all the way through. Yeah. So if there's an area that's that's dead. It's not a majority of the park. Right, absolutely it's not a majority of the park. So, so, okay. So that would just be my ask, if there's any way to do that. Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll go sit down with the staff tomorrow and look, look at that, absolutely. Any further questions on the parks before we move on? All right, thank you, Mr. Duffy. Mm -hmm. 
So as the council's aware, uh, this is uh, the Grand Terrace High School Titans. This is the class of 2020. And unfortunately for this particular class, they've, they've come into an issue where COVID-19 has ruined their grad night, their, uh, their graduation, and multiple uh, activities. So the activities, uh, the activities director for the high school contacted uh, me and requested that, um, so Grand Terrace's normal high school graduation includes fireworks. And the fireworks are normally put on by uh, fundraising from the parents and the high school students. The Colton Joint Unified School District does not uh, fund fireworks shows. And so one of the things that the activities director requested was that um, they talked with a fireworks company and they said, how, do, how can we create a fireworks show that can be seen by everyone in the community without having to gather in one, in one location? And so what the fireworks company said was the best location is the high school uh, baseball uh, baseball soccer, uh, baseball fields that are right next to Veterans Freedom Park. Now, the school district does not, um, will not allow the high school class to do a fireworks show. But the city does have a um, joint use agreement, and the, the high school class asked us, because the city of Colton normally does an annual fireworks show to celebrate their annual anniversary. So they said, is this something that the city could, 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 could sponsor in terms of just hosting the facility? We will pay for the entire, uh, for the entire event. And so they were requesting that this fireworks show occur on May 28th, 2020. I contacted the superintendent and the school board and asked if they had any issues if the city did agree to sponsor this particular program. The superintendent said that he would check and he said to me that there doesn't appear to be any issue associated with us sponsoring and using our joint use agreement to, to host the program. Um, we anticipate that the cost for the fireworks show, for a three to five minute fireworks show, would be about $3,500. And then we're anticipating two officers, about 10 hours for the evening, would be about seven dollars $800. And then for the remaining, for our, our maintenance staff to have to be available for any issues associated with the setup or the takedown for the pirate company. So we anticipate between five and seven thousand dollars is the total cost and that's is what the um, the high school uh, parents and the, the class of 2020 would need to uh, pay the city for our cost as, and also the cost for the uh, fireworks company. Thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. I do. Council Member Robles and then Alan. Uh, I would just so they have the uh, um, appropriate funds? They have that, that level of funding available? Y yes, they indicated to me that, that they did, and they had uh, private donors that would, would give them the, the, that money. Yes. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Allen? Okay, thank you, Mayor. I just want to ask the City Manager, I just want to make sure I'm clear that we're paying for it and they're reimbursing us. Is that correct? So, or paying, we're paying for a portion. Of well, 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 yes. And so here's how this would work, especially for um, with the sheriff's department. So if we hire the sheriff to do overtime, it's a different rate than, than someone, somebody else would do. So that would be the best thing for us to do is to have the sheriff uh, do the overtime, and then we would, we would bill that once they gave us the, the, the proceeds for that. In addition to that, we would uh, have our maintenance crew uh, bill the time to this activity, and then we would send a bill, and they would, we would be reimbursed. But uh, the actual contract with the fireworks company, um, they, the fireworks company, they, they pull all the county permits and they'll work with county fire. I've, I've, I've worked on that uh, structure there. Um, uh, the question becomes uh, in terms of who is actually cutting the check for the fireworks company. And that can go one of two ways. Uh, the donors can pay them directly or we can we can take in the donations and then issue out the the um, 
the, the, the payment to the fireworks company. Uh, and uh, but but by us doing that, we would end up with, I believe, an increased liability. So my goal would be is is for them to pay the fireworks company, and then the fireworks company would have the proper insurances to work with us on being uh, being on site. That's good because that was going to be my next question was about liability <laughs> and our responsibilities, and also um, are we. Are we in danger of setting some sort of a precedent so that next year and next year and for a year on now and each and every school now, I mean, who, where, will we, where will we say no? Well, I, I think in this particular case, what the school district, what the Grand Terrace High Class of 2020 is asking us is that the fireworks show the three to five minute fireworks show is a tradition for their graduation. And so they're saying that, well, this is one of the traditions that, that they could keep. I don't believe they would ever ask us to do this again because part of the part of the graduation ceremony is having those fireworks on site. In this particular case, uh, there's no community um, uh, collection of people, uh, no activity. This is we're, all we're doing is having a place for the fireworks company to set off the fireworks. We're not, we're not opening the, the parks. We're not doing anything of that particular nature. People will be able to watch the fireworks show from their homes or from their cars, but there will be no community gathering locations. And a part of the whole graduation ceremony normally is these, the fireworks show happens at, at, the, at the event. Okay. And regarding liability, we're, we are we're going to make sure that we're not going to be liable. Is that right? That, that is correct. The fireworks company it will have all the liability insurances that are necessary to assume the responsibility. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. I make a motion for a hearty approval. All right. Second. All right, I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson, second. a second by Council Member Hussey. I have a question, though. Would it be possible for us to take in, in escrow the money that the the three to five thousand or the five to seven thousand from the uh, the parents and the students and all that, so that we have it and we can pull draw down on that instead of having to find out where they are after we have our expenses come in. Yes, we can set up a, a, a much like we would do with a developer or anybody yes. else doing a project in town, and so we just hold it in escrow until we get those invoices. We could show them the invoices, yes. but yeah. but I think that would be a nice way yeah. to do that. Yeah, so we would we would be looking at probably anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. That's for the sheriff's cost and 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 our cost. We can certainly do that. Okay, and then are there any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right. So I'll bring it back to council. We have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson and a second by Council Member Hussey. Please call the vote. Council Member Allen? Yes. Council Member Hussey? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Yay. <laughs> Mayor Magnabo? Yay. <laughs> motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to our request for future agenda items by City Council. And as you remember, um, Pursuant to Brown Act, we will not actually take action on this item and we will not discuss other items during this time. We have one request for this evening and it's that uh, to prohibit the use of gas leaf blowers and it's requested to be added to the agenda by Council Member Sylvia Robles. Is there anything beyond that that you would like to say? Um, no, I um, just sent some articles of interest. Um, apparently, um, in a tweet, Twitter feed, um, the um, it was brought up uh, that a number of people now having to work at home, and that's going to be a new normal working at home. Um, and um, we don't know how long. In some jurisdictions, um, for for example, the Cal State system is not going to return to um, physical classes, and so there is a lot of concern now that people are at home and they're being exposed to um, this noise pollution and the Air Quality Board has some um, tangible um, solutions. And finally, that there was um, also a nexus between respiratory um, 
um, issues and uh, gas blowers so that I thought on some future agenda that we might look at this. All right, thank you, Council Member Robles. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson, you had comment? I will wholeheartedly uh, support the idea of us putting it on a, a future agenda item. The sooner the better. Very good. So motion by Council Member Robles, second by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Will you please call the roll? Council Member Allen? Yes. Council Member Hussey? Yes. Council Member Robles? Oh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson? Yay. <laughs> Mayor Magnabo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you. City Manager Communications, Mr. Duffy. Mayor, I actually don't have a slideshow presentation today, but I do want to ask the council. Um, one of the things that we are doing in, in, in preparation for our new budget, uh, we need to have your priorities workshop. And so one of the things I'd like to do is try to schedule that in an off-council week, and I wanted to make sure that um, you might be available as early as next week, or would you like to wait until the, the after the following council meeting on the 26th to have it the fall or that that week or the following week after that? Hmm. Councilmember Robles, you have a preference. I, I prefer after the next meeting. Okay. All right. What about Councilmember Hussey? What do you prefer? Either way, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Either way. Council Member Allen. Uh, <clears throat> either way, I'm fine. Okay. If you would send us some dates then after the next meeting. We'll do. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's all we have. All right. Next regular city council meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 26, 2020 at 6 p.m. Any request to have an item placed on future agenda must be made in writing and submitted to city clerk's office and the request will be processed in accordance with council procedures. And we close tonight in memory of former San Bernardino County Supervisor Dennis Hansberger. Please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. With that, we are adjourned. Some of our commercial businesses would not be able